Linen tablecloths, fine china, excellent food, amazing service. Dining by rail used to be offered on trains across America. These days, it's mostly relegated to private and tourist railways that give their visitors a taste of the past. In 1869, four short years after the nation had been divided by the Civil War, the United States became more united than ever by the Transcontinental Railroad. And with trains traveling further and further, there were new necessities. The Pullman Car Company created the first comfortable all-night sleeper car in 1865. But if you were traveling far enough to sleep on the train, you would also have to eat. Now, food for travelers by rail was nothing new, but it did have issues. You could jump off the train during a stop and run to one of the questionable diners near the railroad station, but there were reports more than once of these diners serving the food just before the train was ready to depart, leaving plenty of leftovers to be repurposed for the next train full of passengers. Another option was to hang your head out of the train window and purchase from a vendor on the platform. The quality of that food, however, was typically suspect, and once you bought it, you were stuck with it. Travelers sometimes brought their own food aboard the train, but the leftovers left an aroma and sometimes attracted flies. So the best solution was for the railroad to feed its own passengers. It was in 1867 that the Pullman Car Company created the first real dining car with a small kitchen and two dining areas. Hopeful of its success, Pullman called it the Delmonico after the famed New York eatery and family of restaurateurs. Dining cars caught on. Through the remainder of the 1800s and early 1900s, more and more railroads added more and more dining cars, and dinner on the diner became a staple of long-distance rail travel. Railroad historian James Porterfield says by 1930, there were some 1,700 dining cars rolling across the rails in the United States. Dining cars were standardized by the early 1900s and have barely changed. There was a kitchen, typically 7 feet by 20 feet, with a passageway alongside for passengers to move through. The rest of the car was dedicated to tables or booths along each side with an aisle down the center. Standard dining car seated 36 with 12 tables. That capacity would increase to 48 as cars got bigger. And on trains serving larger numbers, table cars were added and placed adjacent to the diner. In the tight confines of this kitchen, there would be a chef two to three assistants, four to six waiters going in and out, and a steward. That's a lot of staff. Financially, it was a loser. In his excellent histories of railroad dining, E. Gordon Mooneyhan says that for every dollar made by a railroad diner, the railroad would have to spend $1.38. Diners never made money, but in the early 1900s, there was little to differentiate one railroad from another. They all went from point A to point B. The food service, however, could make the traveling experience something truly special. White table linens, fine china, food that highlighted the region specific to that railroad, excellent service. That was something marketing teams for the railroads could sink their teeth into and truly sell a traveling experience. Into the 1920s and 30s, railroad dining cars would rival any fine dining establishment. Except this food was served on wheels, traveling at 80 miles an hour. Fast food, indeed. On the Southern Railway, they served Georgia peaches. The Atlantic coastline served Welsh rarebit. Many trains, including Southern and Norfolk and Western's Pelican train, kept prunes on the menu. It was a staple of rail travel. Virginia ham was also a feature. The Northern Pacific Railroad touted their great baked potato, a potato weighing in at two to five pounds with a railroad branded spoon and a lot of butter. The Pennsylvania Railroad offered shoe fly pie, taken from the Pennsylvania Dutch of the region. The Baltimore and Ohio offered the help yourself salad. The server would carry it around in a huge bowl that was drizzled with Catalina dressing and blue cheese. One of the stranger offerings was aboard the Gulf Mobile in Ohio. It was a chicken sandwich with a hard boiled egg, Thousand Island dressing, and caviar. It was offered for $2.25, or somewhere around 1850 in today's terms. With the onset of the Great Depression and the sacrifices of World War II limiting travel and availability of goods, dining cars began to wane. Following the war, when railroads tried to bring them back to their former glory, they found that while Americans were still on the move, more and more often they were on the move by car and not by train. The services were still offered for years to come, but they declined 
as passenger railroad travel declined. Continue to learn at home with other great videos from the North Carolina Transportation Museum on Facebook, YouTube, and nctrans.org. The North Carolina Transportation Museum in Spencer is the museum that moves you.